I'm so glad to see all of you. Uh, I'm here tonight to take the opportunity to welcome Dr. Michael Zygmunt, which I will do in a moment. First of all, I want to say that this is sponsored by the Graduate Center, which is an entity within the Graduate College of the University of Arizona, also the Office of Research and Discovery, and the School of Mind, Brain, and Behavior are sponsoring uh, Dr. Zygmunt. He is an incredible person. <laughs> Uh, he is, let me tell you just a little bit about him, he's a professor of neurology, neurobiology, and psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh. He is also a distinguished professor at Fudan University in China. He got his PhD in bio, uh, biopsychology from the University of Chicago and did postdoctoral work in neuropharmacology at MIT. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And he is very active. I mean, his, his curriculum vita goes on and on. So I'll just, I've picked out a couple of things to tell you. One is that he's very active in the international science community. For example, he's on advisory boards uh, of the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's disease and the advisory board of Columbia University Udall Center. That's a special name around here uh, in a program on Parkinson's disease and has served on many advisory boards of, of federal agencies such as National, uh, National Institutes of Health. His research interests, that you'll hear some uh, about them tonight, are on the neurobiological bases of various kinds of brain disorders, uh, such as neurological disorders and psychiatric disorders, as well as what happens to the brain in normal aging, which of course isn't happening to any of us in here, of course. Uh, especially relevant to this talk is his interest in how exercise and other lifestyle variables influence the changes in the brain. Uh, he's been a very successful scientist. He's got 45 years of continuous federal funding as well as uh, um, over 250 published articles. Uh, he is a very kind and engaging individual. He's a very dear friend and you're very fortunate to have a chance to hear him talk about this. So let's welcome Michael Zippen. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, if you ever have a chance to, to select somebody to introduce you, I would suggest uh, <laughs> Jenny as, uh, as the person of choice. She's great. Um, we've known each other actually for 20 years. She was a high school student when I first met her. <laughs> and um, we've actually done a lot of things together, although this is the first time. Uh, I've actually been here once before, but uh, this not to give this, this sort of talk. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I gave someone of you the challenge to make a list of things that I say that you didn't understand because I consider those to be, I will consider them, if there are any, to be failures and I hope that you will call me on them. So I'm going to start out a little slowly. I'm going to start out, which is the current um, norm, I think, with a selfie. This is a, <laughs> this is a picture I took of myself uh, at the Smithsonian uh, Museum of Natural History, which I recommend to you for any number of reasons. Uh, this was taken about three years ago. Uh, here's another selfie. This was taken about 200,000 years ago. And uh, you may think it's a different person, but actually if you look really closely, <laughs> you'll see that the eyes are the same. Um, I wasn't wearing glasses back then. They hadn't been invented yet, but the mouth is the same. And this is actually me. Uh, the, uh, the Smithsonian has some kind of a program that will tell you what you look like at various ages. I decided to stop here at 200,000. It, it gets pretty uh, sticky after that. And uh, the reason I'm starting here is because th the two questions that I'm going to address in the next 45 minutes or so are, first of all, what has changed during the 200,000 years that elapsed uh, between this picture and that one? And secondly, why do we care? Why, why is it important? Um, so I want to acknowledge several people uh, and organizations. Jenny, who invented this idea of having us come here and give a series of lectures. We actually, we as Beth Fisher, who was here in this very place this morning, we gave a lecture to some of the graduate students and we're giving another one to the neurobiology graduate students 
uh, tomorrow afternoon, actually two of them tomorrow. Um, so she, she is our uh, sponsor. Um, I, while I'm talking about specific people, I'd like to thank Leslie Tolbert, who's probably responsible for at least half of you who are here tonight, <laughs> and I, I appreciate that very much. I should say that I've taught, I've taught everybody from uh, third graders up through college, graduate school, and, uh, and then adult education, and um, it's only the people in adult education programs like this who actually arrive before I do. The graduate students arrive always a little bit late. The medical students are the worst. They arrive late with their newspaper, which is what they do while I'm lecturing to them. <laughs> so I take that as a good measure um, that, that you are interested in this. And then uh, the, the people here who sponsored this series, I guess I'm the second in a long series of lectures, which I wish I could attend. They all look very interesting. Uh, NIH and the Department of Defense have sponsored me over the years. And then lots of collaborators, and I'll try to mention at least some of those collaborators as I go along. These are what the things that I want to talk about. First, I'm going to introduce this concept of lifestyle and uh, brain health and, and why I think it's such an important topic. Um, second, I'll talk a little bit about the specific condition that has uh, been the, the focus of my research for 40 years, actually. If my mother was here, she would say, 40 years and you still don't know the answer. <laughs> and that's true, I don't. Uh, then I'll talk about exercise and how that intersects, I think, with uh, um, uh, Parkinson's disease. I'll say a few things, not too much, because I promised that you would understand everything I say. So I'm not going to get into much detail. If anybody wants more details, I'm talking tomorrow, I think, around noon. Uh, uh, that's the sort of neurobiology talk. And then I'll just say a few things at the end. So first, uh, lifestyle and brain health. If I asked you to make a list of the principal causes of uh, morbidity, illness, and mortality, death, my guess is that most of you would get it wrong. Because in fact, things like malaria, polio, it's true that we're in the midst of at least one, probably two or three epidemics now of communicative, communicative diseases, but they are not the main cause of mortality and morbidity in the world, not just in the United States. So here's a quote back almost 10 years ago from the World Health Organization, which says, the, burden, the global burden of disease is shifting from infectious diseases like malaria to non-communicable diseases, with chronic conditions such as heart disease and stroke now being the chief causes of death globally. So there are many examples, I just mentioned two, of non-communicative diseases. Heart disease, many cancers, respiratory conditions like chronic lung disease, um, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. These are all examples of communicative, communicative diseases. They account for about 60% of deaths worldwide. And again, I'm not just talking about developing country, developed countries. I'm talking about worldwide. 80% of the deaths caused by non-communicative diseases, that is, diseases that you don't catch from someone else, 80% of them in low in, are, occur in low- and middle-income countries. They are what we need to begin to focus on, and they are going to become an increasing problem in the years ahead. You've all heard about Alzheimer's disease. You're worried about Alzheimer's disease. I am too. This is my 75th year. I'm getting there. Um, both my parents uh, uh, died of dementia, so I'm all too sensitive to that as perhaps the chief problem that we, the um, older generation, need to worry about. Um, there's huge impacts, personal impacts, impacts to our caregivers, if any of you have taken care of a patient with a condition like Alzheimer's disease or stroke, you know the burden that you faced. I remember the burden that my mother faced when my father, who died first, um, had dementia. And of course, the cost is almost incalculable. So what causes this? What causes this? 
Well, one of the things that people point to is an increased lifespan, and that is a reasonable thing to point to because virtually all the conditions, that's an exaggeration, but most of the conditions, certainly Alzheimer's disease as you know, have as their principal risk factor um, advanced aging. And if you ask people, well, what did the lifespan look like even 100 years ago, let alone 1,000 years ago, they'll say, well, it, it was about 30. And now the lifespan in the United States uh, and most Western countries is in the order of 80. I'm sorry to say that the United States is far from the longest uh, lifespan. It's actually in the middle of the lifespans of Western countries. Um, but that calculation of 30 to 80 is very misleading because in fact it includes p infant mortality. So you have to ask yourself, well, okay, let's subtract out people who died before they were six, let's say. And then it also includes women who died at childbirth. And it includes people who died from accidents, like falling from trees or being eaten by animals or in wars, which, believe it or not, used to be worse than they are now, although it is hard to believe. So if you subtract out people that died from those conditions, actually the difference is relatively small. It's more like 60 to 80. And although that may explain some of the increase in, in non-communicable diseases, it's certainly not all of it. So another cause of this rise is environmental um, changes. And, and we are very aware of that these days. Um, air pollution is one. Uh, I don't know that air pollution is a big problem here, but I just heard a lecture about air pollution in Los Angeles, for example, or, um, or Mexico City. And you've all seen, I'm sure, the, uh, the pictures of air pollution in Beijing and Shanghai, where I also teach. It's really quite incredible. It's, it is true that you can stand on one street corner in Beijing and not see the buildings on the other street corner. And some of you are nodding your head, so you, you've seen that. Um, water pollution, water pollution is certainly on our minds domestically because of Flint. And it turns out that Flint is not an exception. There are many uh, mun municipalities in the United States that have been suffering from water pollution for years. And exactly why that is and, and why the richest country in the world can't control that is, is a very uh, important and sad question. And the third is food scarcity. Believe it or not, food scarcity, famine, is a bigger problem now than it was 40,000 years ago. 40,000 years ago, when there wasn't enough food or enough water, you moved to a place where there was food and water. I'm from a city, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where nobody moves. It's the second oldest average city in the United States. The steel industry shut down, but people stayed. Um, so food scarcity is something that we can't, or at least don't, deal with by moving. So the environment is certainly a, a, a one of the causes. But what I'm going to focus on is our lifestyle, our changing lifestyle, our dramatically changing lifestyle. So there are two factors that kill more people than any other. The first is smoking. And until rather recently, smoking was the major lifestyle. But catching up, and perhaps by now overcoming smoking, is obesity. And obesity, as we know, is caused by two factors. One is poor diet and the other is a lack of exercise. Now, I drove here on, I think it's called Speedway, and I didn't count the number of fast food restaurants that I passed, uh, and, but it made me wonder exactly how many fast food restaurants are there in the United States, and I don't know the answer, but I'd like to know. It must be thousands and thousands of them, and of all sorts, but in, at the end of the day, they're all basically the same in terms of the quality of the food that people ingest. And there are people that eat in, in fast food restaurants every day, maybe even more than once a day. So if it hasn't happened yet, it will happen within the next few years. Obesity will be the major killer, 
worldwide. It is one of our exports, along with smoking. I saw a picture just the other day, by the way, I, I don't think I'll ever forget it, of a five-year-old smoking, I think, in Thailand. It was just incredible. But um, food, our, the quality of food is, um, is an export. I was in China two years ago. I took a, a, a taxi, a bus, an elevator, and another bus to the very top of a mountain. Um, and when I got out of it, there was the biggest McDonald's I'd ever seen at the top of that mountain. It took me an hour to get there. I didn't go in. Okay, so how do we spend our time? I've already said one of the things that we spend our time, which is eating very bad food. But how do we spend our time? Well, out af after work, the major, the major consumer of our time is television. I don't know if anybody here can guess how many hours of television the average person watches, but you get an idea if you just go for a walk in the evening and you see these kind of blue fluorescent things flickering through the window. But believe it or not, we spend almost five hours a day as adults watching television. I mean, that's incredible. I am proud to say that although we have two televisions, I have never allowed my wife to teach me how to use those little things we call clickers. <laughs> and so um, once in a while while she's traveling, there's something I have to watch. So I have to call her up and she walks me through the use of these, of these devices. Um, so we spend almost five hours a day watching television. I mean, that is just amazing. You have to turn the television on as soon as you get back from work and you have to watch it while you're eating dinner and then keep watching it until you go to sleep to get five hours in. I mean, that's not easy. Um, the second uh, thing that we do is eat, which could be good, but uh, you probably can't tell what these people are eating, but I don't see an item of protein there. It seems to be all carbohydrates and we eat an enormous amount of carbohydrates. The third thing we do is exercise. How much time do we spend exercising a day? Less than 20 minutes. And that gets worse and worse as you get older and older, beginning with high school. Right? So we've all seen our children and grandchildren when they're preschool ages. You put them down and they're gone. And I still remember taking one of my young cousins to a science museum. And I, every time I stopped at an exhibit, he disappeared. I couldn't find him, so I, ha I could, had to stop looking at the exhibits. And I finally had upon an idea. Turn up which volume? Just this? Get, oh, okay, sorry. I'm sorry, if, if you can't hear me, any of you, uh, raise your hand. Um, so I convinced them that actually this was a museum of tiles. The tiles were on the floor, and we were going to look at each tile. And the second exhibit was the windows. So every time we came to a window, we would look at the windows. And I managed to keep track of him for about an hour. Um, so, so that's what little kids do. They, they, they don't need to go to the gym. They don't need any in, enticement. They are active all the time. But we're not. We become less and less active. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about how that is, what happened to that urge to, to exercise that we had literally built into us when we were little um, as we get older and older. Now, of course, three things, that's a lot to keep track of. So some people that are very efficient manage to do all three of them at once. So this person is watching television. You can see an exercise ball right here. And, uh, and he's eating fast food. So he's being very effective. He can get his four hours in while still touching on exercise and a crappy diet. So here we are in Tucson. How, I mean, I, I, I guess there are days that you don't go outside, but I don't exactly know why. I've, I've already heard the lecture about the fact that, yes, it's 90 degrees in the summer, but it's dry heat, so it's <laughs> very comfortable. And um, 115, yeah, there we go. But um, so, so Arizona must be different, right? Well, actually, it's not so different. So here you are. This is Arizona here. So um, I 
25 to 29 percent of Arizonians and Arizonians are have a basal metabolic. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, basal metabol metabolic body mass index. Sorry, body mass index of more than 30. Right, you should be somewhere around 20 to 25 max, and 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 uh, 25 to 30 percent of the people in this state have a, a BMI of 30. Now, it's not as bad as some states, including my own state, which is here, but it's not as good as it could be, uh, or even as California, which ha also has fine weather and lots of wonderful things to do outside, has. So you say, okay, well, you know, there's lots of lots of people in in Arizona that that uh, are, don't get outside and don't exercise. But Tucson, I mean, come on, Tucson's got to be better. No, actually, Tucson is worse. So here is a little uh, thing that I found on the web yesterday. Approximately 26.6 percent of the adults in Pima County, I had to check to be sure that that was the right county, but I'm sorry to say that it is, are obese, obese, which is higher than the state's obesity rate, which is 24.7 percent, which is not exactly something to be proud of. High school students are at increasing risk for obesity with physical activity levels and fruit and vegetable consumption of Arizona youth ranking lower than those of their national counterparts. So if any of you are in school boards that are trying to save money by cutting out physical education, getting rid of recess, and having pizza for uh, lunch, this is something that you might want to bring to their attention. OK, so here's a nice view. It happens that it wasn't here at the Sawara National Park, where I was two days ago, which is just amazing. Uh, it's in the Rift Valley, which I've also been in, in, in this case, probably Kenya. And, uh, and here we are evolving, as we all did uh, in the Rift Valley, from our um, non-human primate ancestors up through uh, increasingly uh, modern humans. And then <laughs> that's where we are now. This is not an exaggeration. Um, none of it, except maybe the clothes. But um, the overweight, the, um, the poor posture, and the sugary drinks, which people have tried to outlaw and failed, um, are characteristic of, of us now. So the basic hypothesis that I am presenting to you today is that we evolved under one set of conditions. and to a large extent, not entirely, we are still evolving in little ways, but to a large extent, our lifestyle, our, our, our genes are stuck where they were more than 40,000 years ago, much more than 40,000 years ago, but our lifestyle has changed dramatically and exponentially. So when you think about what happened when we, came, we became farmers and herders, we settled down. Later, the Industrial Revolution, we stayed indoors and worked hours in Pittsburgh. You worked 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Then you worked for 24 hours, and then you took a day off, and you switched to nighttime versus daytime um, work. And that, that was the Industrial Revolution. Then came um, the car uh, and uh, increasing, uh, uh, increasing immobility, and finally the television. So our diet has changed dramatically. Our social interactions have changed dramatically. This is a picture, which is actually a modern picture, of a group of people um, in South Africa, the San. Uh, sometimes they're called the Bushmen. And um, it shows a number of things. One is that people, you can't quite see what they ate, but they, they ate and eat uh, natural um, high fiber grains no white bread for them. Um, they eat as a group. And in fact, when a hunter comes back um, with food, they don't eat it by themselves. They don't even just eat it with their families. It, it belongs to the community. So eating is of high quality. And the, um, 
and the conditions under which they eat are, are um, I would call it, high quality. Extraordinary amounts of physical exercise. I'll give you some statistics in a second. Um, a lot of cognitive stimulation. Things were changing all the time and you had to ever be ever alert to your environment for any number of reasons. Um, the reason you were running was either because you were chasing prey, and it turns out that the way we hunted was not so much with uh, spears and bows and arrows. We hunted by running our prey down because humans are among the very few animals, dogs are the only one I can think of offhand, that can sweat. And other, most animals can't. They can't lose heat in the way that we do. And so we run after them. They run faster than we do, but we run after them. And eventually, they have to stop because of heat stress. And so that's when we pull out our spears or our bow and arrow and we, uh, and we kill them. And finally, stress. I want to talk very briefly about stress. This was a kind of stress that we used to deal with. But we knew what to do. We may or may not have been successful, but we knew that we had to get the heck out of there really fast. And so all the adrenaline and the steroids that got released into our bloodstream, which in the long run could be toxic, uh, in the short run allowed us to do what we had to do, which is to think quickly and run fast. That's not the stress, by and large, that we deal with now. This is the stress that we deal with now. And this is the stress that we deal with now. Now, what are you going to do about that? What are you going to do about the corticosteroid and the adrenaline that gets released? And you all have ha had both of these experiences. And, and, and you can think of many others as well. Airplanes being canceled, um, you know, standing in long lines to get your groceries um, uh, paid for. You can't really do anything. And you just bathe in these toxic substances, which over time cause enormous damage to our bodies in general and our brains in particular. So I want to come back to physical uh, exercise, which is my focus today. So it is estimated that we, as uh, early Homo sapiens, ran the equivalent of a, of a, um, a marathon a day or walked or ran, right? Women tended to walk because they were doing the gathering, and, um, and men tended to run because they were doing the hunting. How about now? How about now? How much do we exercise now? 300 meters a day. 300 meters a day. And if you are a full professor, and you get a parking space right next to your office, it's not even 300 meters a day. Now. For young faculty members, that's a good thing because the old faculty members are going to kill themselves by a lack of exercise. But <laughs> the point, you get the point, right? You've all, I don't suggest that anybody in this room uh, is, uh, has been a party to this, but you've all seen people drive to the, um, to the shopping mall, buy something in one store, and there's another store four away, and they get back in their car and they drive four away. And I have two uh, images that I didn't think to bring today. One is somebody driving to a gym and then taking, taking an escalator up to the <laughs> gym and then, quote, working out. And another person walking a dog by driving with the <laughs> leash out the window as the dog got walked. I mean, we'll do anything to avoid exercise, in contrast to our children and grandchildren. OK, so that's the changing face. And notice these are not adults. And this is not an adult. This person is obviously being a spectacular role model to his little granddaughter. And these people are doing it all. They're watching television. They're sitting uh, without any exercise. And you can see sort of what they're eating. That's the face of our children, let alone us uh, today. So we've evolved under these terrible, uh, under great conditions, and we've changed our w our lifestyle dramatically, dramatically. And this has very toxic consequences. And you probably know most of these things, so I won't go through them. But heart disease, stroke, lung disease, diabetes, some cancers, and things that affect the brain, like depression. These are all things 
that are, um, so these, I'm sorry, that should be decreased, reduced stress. I don't exactly know what that means, but you get the idea, right? The, probably the best antidepressant is exercise, right? So if you find yourself depressed, if you have a way, and running in place counts, uh, of getting involved in exercise, I think you will demonstrate to yourself that exercise is an antidepressant. But I warn you, exercise is addictive. It's true, but it takes a while. Some people estimate you have to exercise regularly for about six months, and then you're addicted. You can't do without exercise. Um, so I have already mentioned Alzheimer's disease. But I want to emphasize that we're not just talking about life and death. We're also talking about the quality of our life, our, our health span. And that is also affected by um, the lack of exercise. So this is an added image. The declining characteristics, in this particular case, physical, but in every case um, of, uh, of life as people get older. But we assume, until we get there ourselves, right? If you had asked me uh, when I was 20 or 30, well, what was I going to be like at 75? I'd say, well, I guess I'll, you know, my memory will be gone, and I, I won't be able to move very well, and you know, I'll be depressed, and, and, and I'll have cognitive impairment. But it turns out that although, of course, there, not of course, there is likely to be a maximum lifespan for humans, it's not 65 or 75 or 85, and it may not even be 95. Um, and a lot of what we take for granted as the reduced quality of life that comes along with aging is the result of our um, lifestyle. So these are some things that many of which I've already mentioned uh, that uh, occur with exercise. I just want to emphasize that on this on this little cartoon, there are a number of things that uh, involve the brain. Sleep, which is one of the most important characteristics of, um, uh, of our lives. There's now very interesting data that suggests that it's during sleep that our brain literally gets cleaned out of the toxins that have developed over the course of the previous um, day. And that if you're not getting at least seven, pro, pre, uh, better eight hours of sleep a day, you are doing damage to yourself. And there are people that are exceptions, but nearly not nearly as many as think they're exceptions. Uh, one of our presidential candidates says that at most he sleeps four hours a day. And as far as I'm concerned, without getting into politics, um, <laughs> some of the things he says are examples of the fact that <laughs> Four hours a day is not enough. Uh, improving mood, improving cog uh, cognition, uh, decreasing stress, uh, and increasing your sense of uh, self-esteem. All of these things are improved by physical exercise. And what I'm going to focus on is uh, neurodegenerative diseases, which means diseases in which neurons in the brain gradually die at a rate which is much greater than you would expect from normal aging. Um, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease are the prime examples. I happen to spend my time talking, uh, doing research on Parkinson's disease, so that's what I'm going to focus on. So let me talk about Parkinson's disease. Probably most of you, if not all of you, know people with Parkinson's disease. Actually, Mo Udall, the reason that there are Udall centers in the United States, of which there are about a dozen, I had one for many years, I'm sorry to say I don't have one now, um, was um, I think that Udall centers were established in honor of Mo Udall, who had very, very severe Parkinson's disease, as you probably know. So here's somebody actually a little bit younger. The neurological consequences of Parkinson's disease usually break through at about age 60. This person looks to me more like 40. Um, but Nonetheless, he shows the principal characteristics of Parkinson's disease. So you see this stooped posture. You see a tremor, which is so great that actually the whole body seems to be tremoring. He's about to turn, and you'll see, well, he's shuffling here. He's about to turn, and he has terrible balance. And in fact, later in the video, I probably won't show it all, he almost falls. He has a masked face, 
and at some point, maybe about now, he tells a joke to the neurologist who's off, off the camera here, but you wouldn't be able to tell that he's telling a joke because his face is completely poker-faced or masked. Um, now he's going to have an even harder time turning. So he is suffering from um, motor deficits. He's suffering from, or will suffer from cognitive deficits. He certainly sh suffers from depression, although not as much as his masked face would suggest. One of the earliest things that happens in Parkinson's disease is um, a lack of olfactory uh, sensation. Nobody knows why, really. Uh, gastrointestinal problems, cardiovascular problems, sleep problems, sexual problems. It actually turns out, in contrast to what people thought when I started working on this question, to be a very complicated and almost whole body uh, disease. And, and we don't understand that. There are some ideas which I won't have time to talk about. So let me just tell you uh, something about, you know, louder, I'm sorry, uh, about the nervous system, right? I'm going to give you a course in neurobiology in a single slide in one minute. So here are just two car cartoons, eight, one cartoon of two neurons making a little piece of a circuit. So the nervous system uh, operates by, in two modes, electrical and chemical. So, so electrical signaling occurs along a neuron. This is the head of the neuron, or called the cell body. This is the axon, um, and this is the nerve terminal. <clears throat> and something, which we won't go into, will trigger a, an electrical signal, which, travel, which will travel down the axon, and then release chemicals into this space, which is called the synapse, so that's the chemical signal, electrical signal, chemical signal. The chemical signal will either stimulate or inhibit a electrical signal in the next neuron. So that, that's what it's all about, really. I don't know why there are probably 40,000 neuroscientists in the United States, because it's all pretty straightforward. But <laughs> <coughs> as my mother would say, it's a living. <laughs> Not a great living, but it's a living. Okay, so, um, so that's, that's, what, uh, that's how the nervous system operates. And neurodegenerative diseases involve the gradual, uh, abnormally rapid and progressive loss of neurons in the brain. So here we have a cartoon of the brain with different parts of the brain labeled according to their name. And if you were to make a section uh, sideways, uh, or I don't know, whatever that would be, sagittal, uh, you would see this as the inside of the brain. And here in the lower part of the brain, just above the spinal cord, is an area called the substantia nigra, which stands for black substance. And it was one of the first parts of the brain that were actually noticed in terms of its uh, histological uh, characteristics because it is black. You don't have to stain it. You see black substances. And what was found was that in th this, is a, this is this area, section through this area, and these are the black uh, cells, the black neurons, called the substantia nigra. Um, and they contain an enzyme that synthesizes dopamine. And what was discovered uh, almost exactly 100 years ago is that patients with Parkinson's disease who died and were autopsied didn't have these black substances. So you see here, almost none of those cells are there anymore. So Parkinson's disease, I said already that it's a, a, a very broad disease with lots of problems, but the problem that is associated with the motor deficits, which is how Parkinson's disease is typically diagnosed, has to do with the loss of these cells and the loss of the chemical transmitter that is utilized by those cells, which is called dopamine. Now, you may not have heard of dopamine, but you've heard of L-DOPA. And L-DOPA is used to treat patients with Parkinson's disease because it gets into the brain. And in the brain, it gets converted to dopamine. So what you're doing is chemically repairing the loss of these dopamine neurons by putting back the dopamine artificially. Now, that's a little weird. And we could talk a little bit about how that's possible, that something as intricate in 
trick kit as the nervous system could have its, some of its neurons replaced by just putting in the transmitter. That's a, an issue I'm very interested in. We won't talk about it now. But that is the reality that treating patients with Parkinson's disease who have lost their dopamine uh, involves the addition of dopamine indirectly. And I, I don't know, how many of you saw the movie Awakenings about 20 years ago? So that was one of the earliest uh, efforts uh, by Oliver Sacks, at, uh, as it happens, who just died this last, in the last 12 months, um, to treat patients with Parkinson's disease with L-DOPA. Okay, so there are lots of drugs now. The first drug, well, not quite the first drug, but one of the first drugs was L-DOPA, and there are lots of other drugs now, although to a large extent, I'm sorry to say, they're kind of me too drugs. There are other drugs that effectively replace the dopamine or the dopamine stimulation um, in Parkinson's disease. And if I had Parkinson's disease, you can be sure that I would take one or more of those drugs because I would be happy to have my symptoms reduced. You've probably seen people, as I said, with Parkinson's disease. There are many famous people that have Parkinson's disease. Michael J. Fox, who was mentioned, is one of them. Muhammad Ali is another. There are lots of people uh, that have Parkinson's disease, and when they're on, they look pretty good when they're off or when they have been over-medicated, they look quite bad. So the problem with these drugs is that they don't seem to affect the underlying disease. The disease progresses. All, all you're doing, and I don't really mean all you're doing because if I had the condition, I'd be happy for it, but what you are doing is reducing the symptoms. Also, the drugs become less and less effective as the disease progresses, and there are side effects, which you've probably seen in, um, in the case of uh, Michael J. Fox, and maybe some people that you know. Okay, so we need to find some way to deal with, with Parkinson's disease. And my message and the focus of my work is that a way to do that is through physical exercise which has side effects which are virtually all good. So we don't need to worry about them. It is a very unusual person who exercises so much. There are such people, but who exercises so much that it does harm to them. And the positive effects are um, outstanding. And again, as I've already alluded to, very broad in their uh, characteristics. Okay, so I have to admit that when a colleague of mine, who I'll introduce you in a, to in a second, called me up and said, I've got some brains of some Parkinsonian rats that uh, exercised. I want you to analyze them because I think that the lesion was reduced. I said that was crazy. I mean, really crazy? You're going to affect the brain through exercise? Now, it is true that I know some people that seem to have muscles in their brains, but um, it, doesn't, it didn't make sense to me. But it was because I was stupid. It's because I didn't know the literature, which was already emerging in the 90s when, when I got that telephone call. So looking back on it, exercise should affect the brain and should be an antidote to Parkinson's disease. Why am I saying that? Okay, so let's compare a couple of things that exercise does to what is the problem with Parkinson's disease. So our energy comes from little... Um, uh, I don't know what you call them, little things inside cells called mitochondria. They are the energy source, the main ed energy source. And in Parkinson's disease, that goes down. Mitochondrial energy production is reduced. Exercise increases it, which won't surprise you. Inflammation is a huge problem in neurodegenerative diseases. It may be the common feature in neurodegenerative diseases, and that includes um, Parkinson's disease. So inflammation goes up. Now, uh, anti-inflammatories uh, can be a problem, as you know if you've taken anti-inflammatory agents. But in general, anti-inflammatories are good because inflammation is, can be toxic. Exercise reduces inflammation. So again, the problem with exercise, I mean the problem with Parkinson's disease is the opposite of the benefit of exercise. And finally, oxidative stress may be the first problem that occurs in um, Parkinson's disease. It's certainly the earliest thing that anybody can detect. 
oxidative stress. What does that mean? That means that an actual oxidation, not unlike rust except it's in cells, of the various constituents of cells, proteins, lipids, genetic material, they get damaged by oxidative stress. And exercise begins by causing more oxidative stress. You won't be surprised by that. But in the long run, it reduces oxidative stress. And that's why you should exercise regularly because basically the body and the brain get used to the exercise <coughs> and the tearing down, as in the case of muscles, that occurs initially with exercise reverses and it starts to build up. So it's logical that exercise should help. So if exercise is so great, don't we already know that exercise is the treatment for Parkinson's disease? And the answer is no, we don't. So there are lots of studies. If you put as a search term, as search terms, exercise and Parkinson's disease, you'll get dozens and dozens of papers that have been written about that. And actually, the University of Arizona is one of the places where some very important work is ongoing. And I'm going to visit their site tomorrow, I'm, I'm pleased to say. But the problem, and I hope that Becky Farley, who is the person that runs that program, would agree with me, is that in most cases, the studies are relatively small, a dozen, two dozen, three dozen patients, and they're relatively brief, weeks to maybe a few months. Now, the problem with that, if those were rats, that would be probably OK. But rats are genetically uh, relatively homogeneous, and they age at a fairly rapid rate. So you can, do, you can do a study for a few months. Our studies typically are three to six months. And that's a significant chunk of their lifespan. That's not true with humans. Humans are very different. If they have Parkinson's disease, they progress at a, at a very different rate, person to person, and relatively slowly, maybe a 5% decline in, in the brain function that's affected by Parkinson's disease a year. So you can imagine in your head, without doing the statistics, that you would have to have maybe 100 patients that were exercising and 100 patients that weren't and carry out the study for one or two years in order to be able to say definitively that the exercise was helpful or not helpful. And that's an enormous amount of time and money. We proposed to NIH that we do that study, but we estimated it would cost $5 million. And they said no, even though if we could demonstrate definitively that exercise should be the, quote, drug of choice, and people used it, it would probably save an enormous amount of money. And by the way, I'm focusing, again, on, on Parkinson's disease. But most of what I could say about Parkinson's disease, I could say about Alzheimer's disease, too. The second problem is that in those studies, you can't differentiate between improving symptoms and reducing the progression of the disease. In order to do that, you would not only have to carry out your study for one or two years, but then you'd have to do what's called a washout. You'd have to say, OK, no more exercise. I don't want you to exercise. I know it was great. You became addicted to it. Sorry, no more exercise. In fact, I'm putting a little Fitbit on your hand, and I'm going to check to be sure you're not exercising. In order to see, do they bounce back to where they would have been, or do they stay where they are? We don't know that, although we have guesses. So it's really too expensive to carry out that study now as, as defined by NIH. So what we do is we study various animal models and cellular models. So here we have monkeys, rats, and mice. Very little monkey, mostly rats and mice. And then cells from the nervous system that we study. And I'll show you a couple of studies of each. Um, so I won't go into the details, but this is another synapse. This is the presynaptic area, the postsynaptic area. That's the synapse. And you can give toxins. These are dopamine neurons. You can give to toxins. We use two. That's one, which causes oxidative stress. And here's another, which causes mitochondrial atrophy, which causes oxidative stress. So the details aren't important. What's important is that we can selectively subtract dopamine neurons from the brain and at least produce that aspect of Parkinson's disease, the loss of dopamine. So we use that as a model. And here's my colleague who got me started, Tim Shallot, who I'm sad to say has Parkinson's disease. It doesn't seem fair. He spent his life studying Parkinson's disease. Now he has it. 
He's the second of my colleagues that, that I know of, actually the third, who developed Parkinson's disease. So what Tim did is he used one of those toxins and he injected it on one side of the brain. If you inject a toxin that affects dopamine on one side of the brain, the other side of the, what did I do? The other side of the body suffers what's called motor neglect. You no longer use that limb. In Parkinson's disease, it tends to be bilateral. We produce a unilateral version. And if you take animals that are like that and you put them in a cylinder, this is a plexiglass cylinder with a mirror image of that plexiglass cylinder so you could see both sides of the animal. What an animal would normally do, a, a, a rodent would normally do, is they'll rear up on their hind limbs and explore the environment with their forelimbs. So take a look at this animal who that's received this toxin on one side of the brain, and I think you'll see that there's a problem. This animal lands on the plexiglass cylinder eight times, and all but one of those eight times, it only lands on the left side, the left forelimb. Doesn't land on the right forelimb. That's because 6-hydroxydopamine, the toxin, has been injected on the um, right side. So the left side is suffering what's called motor neglect. Okay, so then the brilliance of um, uh, Tim was to repeat the experiment, but this time to put a cast on the limb that would be normal, forcing the animal in the week after the toxin to use this limb if it is going to explore or even if it's going to go and look for food and water. And then he took it away. And then he repeated the experiment of looking at the animal. And I defy you to tell me which side is the abnormal side. There is no abnormal side. The animal is landing on both limbs all the time. So with that simple increase in exercise, which lasted in this case only seven days, we have abolished the behavioral effect of this toxin. And I won't go into the details, but we also looked at the brain and we showed that we had effectively abolished the lesion as well. And we've done that in several ways, and I, I will skip some slides, but this is casting, which is not a particularly useful way to, uh, to deal with patients, although it is being used in some cases in the treatment of stroke. We've also used something called a running wheel. We attach a running wheel to uh, the cage of a rat. You've probably all seen in pet stores, gerbils, they'll go into a running wheel and they'll run and run and run. And um, these animals run like eight hours a day. That is maybe a little bit more useful, but we aren't expecting patients to run for eight hours a day. Um, so um, what one of the experiments that I've done with a collaborator, Judy Ca uh, Cameron, has been to use a treadmill, which is uh, a um, reasonable thing to expect. So I'm going to skip all this. So here's Judy, and here is a monkey on a treadmill, which is the same kind of treadmill that you would use. It's just a human treadmill with a little plexiglass box to keep the animals from uh, disappearing from the treadmill. And what she did was she had the animals, she gave the animals a toxin on the right side in this case, and then waited, this is three months of treadmill, toxin, wait a little while, another six weeks of treadmill, and then she looked at the animals behaviorally um, and in a variety of other ways. And so here is something called a PET positron emission tomography. It's a way of non-invasively, it's kind of like an x-ray for the brain, except it targets specific kinds of neurons. In this particular case, we're targeting dopamine neurons. So here is a, uh, a one-sided unilateral lesion. So this is the normal side, and this is the side that suffered from the toxin. And then here's an animal who ran at 60% of its maximum heart rate, so that's a fast walk. That's when you suddenly realize you're late for an appointment, so you kind of speed it up. And here's an animal that's running at 80% maximum heart rate, so that's a jog. And as you can see, as the animals ran faster and faster, the lesion got smaller and smaller until you can actually hardly see the lesion at all. And she's done behavioral tests and biochemical tests, 
And what we saw in rats and have seen in mice um, also is true for monkeys. So exercise affects the, uh, protects the behavior. It protects the dopamine neurons. We see it in several species. No reason at all not to expect that this would translate to humans. And we've used a variety of, of uh, um, ways of exercising. OK, so what's going on here? Here we have some people here in Tucson, Arizona. Maybe one of them is you, I don't know who are exercising. So the question is, how might exercise work? And I'll just spend a short period of time finishing by talking about this. This is what mostly what I do. So I've already said that exercise increases uh, energy produced by mitochondria. It decreases respiration. It decreases oxidative stress. It actually does lots more things. For example, it actually increases the number of synapses in your brain. Part of the reason it's useful for Alzheimer's disease is that if you've exercised for many years and you start losing neurons, you're starting at a higher level. So losing 20% of your neurons if you haven't exercised could be devastating. But if you have exercised and you've got all of these excess neurons, uh, synapses, then you're starting from, you have a kind of safety margin. It actually increases the number of neurons. For a long time, we thought that the number of neurons that you're born with in the brain is as many as you'll ever get, but that turns out not to be true. The brain synthesizes new neurons all the time, and if you exercise, it does that even better. It increases the number of fine blood vessels in the brain, which, kind of like sleep, helps to clear out the brain of toxins and, by the way, bring in more oxygen. So these are all good things. Another thing that exercise does, and it's what we focus on, is it increases the concentration of a group of compounds called neuroprotective or neurotrophic factors. So what are neurotrophic factors? That's what I will finish with. Neurotrophic factors are factors that are released from other cells onto neurons. They're transmitted, trans, transported down to the cell body where the death program exists. When neurons die, they die because of a genetically driven cell death program, and neurotrophic factors inhibit that. That's their job. Lots I could say about them, but they inhibit cell death, neuronal death in particular. So exercise, which protects neurons, also works to increase the concentration of the factors that protect neurons. And we're putting our money on that as being one of the main reason, ways in which exercise protects. We haven't proven it yet, but we have started. And one experiment that we've done is an experiment by a graduate student of mine named Annie Cohen. So what she did is she bypassed the exercise, and she injected the trophic factor directly into the brain. For those of you who know about trophic factors, the trophic factor she used was called GDNF, but it would probably work with several different, in fact, we know it would work with several different trophic factors. And then she gave the toxin, and then she looked eight weeks later, and this is what she found. Here is the animal that wasn't given the toxin. Here's the animal that was given the toxin. This is measuring the size of the, do the loss of dopamine. It's huge. And the animal that was given the toxin, but with the trophic factor, had a dramatically reduced um, loss of, of the dopamine neurons. So we can substitute a trophic factor for exercise. Now, that's a correlation. It's not causation. And we are now doing genetic experiments to see whether, for example, if we knock out the gene that is responsible for trophic factors, will exercise still work? Our hypothesis is that it won't, that without the trophic factors, exercise doesn't help. Now, we would like to look at individual cells. There are lots of reasons for that. So here is a piece of brain that's being dissected. And then here are some um, s nerve cells that are in a Petri dish that are growing. And we can keep them growing depending on how we do it for days to weeks to months. And then we can look in the microscope, and we can actually count the number of neurons of a particular type, if we want, like dopamine neurons. And we can do biochemistry and molecular biology and all sorts of things on these neurons. They have lots of advantages. We can actually look at molecular mechanisms. We can do it um, much more quickly and much less expensively uh, than with animals. 
So this I'm just going to show you one experiment. This is the number of cells in our petri dish, dopamine cells in our petri dish. If we don't do anything, if we give six uh, a toxin, we reduce the number of uh, dopamine neurons by about 50 percent. And if we repeat the experiment in the presence of the trophic of the trophic factor, we completely abolish the effects of toxins. So we have an animal model and a cellular model of what we think is the neuroprotective effects of exercise. So we are now looking at the mechanism of that, and I won't talk about that at all, except to say that here's the toxin. It's causing oxidative stress. It's killing the animals. And we now have evidence to suggest that the trophic factor acts on a receptor, and it stimulates what's called a survival cascade, um, which then inhibits the oxidative stress and keeps the cells alive. <laughs> It's not quite as easy as that, but <laughs> okay. So um, I think I, I don't need to go through this. We, we think that we can mimic exercise with trophic factors, and we were beginning to understand the mechanism. So what are we, what, what is the bottom line, and what should we do next? First of all, we are way too sedentary, all of us, including me. Uh, there's never too few excuses for not exercising, right? I mean, I had to get up and prepare my lecture, and then I had to have uh, breakfast, which, which was a healthy breakfast. I was not a fast food breakfast. Um, and then I went back to the room after the lecture we gave uh, at uh, noon, and I thought, well, I'll go to the gym, nice gym in the hotel, but maybe I'll take a little nap first. <laughs> there you go. Um, Exercise promotes resiliency, and I think that's the best word. Resiliency against oxidative stress, um, psychological stress, all sorts of things. Exercise is great. It's the best medicine. Um, it's helpful for Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and in general, age-related decline. We know something about how it works. We need to know a lot more, although I wouldn't wait. There is no reason to wait. And I wouldn't wait for Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease or age-related decline. Start today, or at least tomorrow. Um, you, you will suffer, I am virtually certain, less uh, neuronal death, more synapses, more blood flow, uh, and lots of other good things. So we are faced with several questions. First. What are the optimal characteristics of exercise? That's a question that usually comes up, and I don't know the answer. Is it strength? Is it aerobic? Um, is it um, dance? Is it tai chi? Is it yoga? It's probably any of those things, which is a real challenge to people like me. So if tai chi is neuroprotective and aerobics is neuroprotective, what do they have in common? And I don't actually know the answer to that. I actually have a grant now to study electroacupuncture, and it turns out that acupuncture stimulates trophic factors in the brain. So it's, there's, I mean, there are more mysteries than, than answers right now, and we need to explore it. Secondly, what about other lifestyle characteristics? I've only focused on exercise, but I said earlier, stress, environmental um, um, cognitive stimulation, um, sleep, I don't think I mentioned that. And for me, probably the single most important factor in your lives is social interactions. There's an extraordinary correlation between the number of social interactions up to about five. After five, you don't need any more friends, but you need at least <laughs> five close friends, starting with one close friend. People that you can count on to help you, people whose opinions you value and whose opinions you offer. Um, and and there's, a, there's an enormous correlation uh, between friends and health span and even lifespan. Now, sometimes it's important for me to emphasize that living alone is not what I'm talking about. It turns out that people who live alone have more friends and more social interactions on average than people who have a partner. If you have a partner, you've got a television. You've got five hours to, to, <laughs> to get in, so that's your social interactions. But if you live by yourself, 
the literature says, you will go out and you have dinner together and you go to movies together and do all sorts of things. So I'm not saying that living by yourself is a bad thing. I'm saying being lonely is a bad thing. And finally, why do we make such bad decisions? The importance of exercise, even if it's only now that we're beginning to understand it with respect to the brain, the importance of exercise has been around for a very long time. So why do we have pictures like this? And you can find them anywhere. I'm sure you know people that look like this. And I said that exercise was responsible for non-communicative diseases. This man is communicating something to this little girl. So lifestyle is communicated. People that are overweight hang together. People that smoke hang together. People that eat at fast food restaurants hang together. So it's a misnomer. It's not really non-communicative. So here's one of my favorite cartoons. All these years, and this is the doctor, although it could be the other way around, as some of you know from doctors you've had, but this is the doctor because he has a stethoscope. Uh, this person is smoking, he's drinking, and he's overweight. All these years, you haven't listened to a damn thing I've said, have you? So here I am, <laughs> and this is what I'm trying to do. <laughs> Thanks very much. Oh, yeah, absolutely.